Hello again, everyone. So, uh, I had a little bit of time today. Thought I might go and do a, uh, a tutorial of sorts. <clears throat> I was, uh, just looking around on YouTube, and I've noticed that there are some videos on Run 8, but, uh, it's kind of a lack of some of the more prototypical stuff. So I thought this might be a good time to look at doing them. So today we're going to talk about uh, brake tests. What they are and um, what you're supposed to do during them. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, I may have in my day done a brake test or thousand. You know, I've actually, I've actually, believe it or not, seen the CFR Part 49. It's shocking, I know. I might have even looked in one. I mean, guys, there's a lot of words in those things. You just, you just won't believe how much stuff is actually in them. And they want you to know that stuff. I mean, we just used it as a paperweight or sometimes it'd be used as a doorstop. You know, if the toilet paper was running low in the bathroom, you know, in a pinch. But, um, all serious, well, seriousness aside, there is a procedure. I don't like the way that the CFR explains it. Um, usually railroads will have their own procedure for how you do a brake test. It'll be in their rule book. It'll tell you this is the steps that you go through. So it'll vary a little bit from railroad to railroad. So what I do is... Um, going to be a little bit different than what it says in the book. We can't do it 100% prototypical because we can't get out the brake stands on these. But um, we'll kind of go through it. So, there are, according to the CFR Part 49, it's 232.5, if I remember right. It has your brake tests in there. Um, there are four types. There is the class one, initial terminal. Guess where you do that. There is the type 1A, which is also known as the thousand mile um, brake check. We're not going to worry about that one. There's a class two. Sometimes you'll hear that one called maybe a transfer test. And then there's the class three. This one, we saw it a lot. Um, typically, when you have trains that you don't really break up, um, they don't go a thousand miles, but they um, they stay together. You, you're supposed to do an initial terminal every 24 hours, but sometimes you move a train, it sits for a little while, and before the 24 hours is up, you'll start again, then you do your class three. You'll hear it called a set and release, continuity check, um, stuff like that. That's basically what it is. So we'll go, we'll go through them. So I have two trains here, two fabulous locomotives. I also have, and I'll, I'll forewarn you, um, I just, I can't remember if the AI trains are affected by defects. So what I did was I went in here and um, down here to locomotive failure chance, it's all the way to the right. So, um, we're going to see if uh, chaos ensues or not, because I'm not the dispatcher and I don't have to worry about it. So, that being said, let's go on here. We'll do our class one and our class three on this consist. Then we'll do our class two on this consist here. So, let me zoom out a little bit. So, class one, initial terminal, is done at the initial terminal. But railroaders are kind of simple people. You have to to spell stuff out for them so that way they understand hold their hand a little bit lord knows they try just just be patient with them so what the initial terminal is is as it says on the tin it's a, the initial terminal of a train so let's pretend okay we're, we're here in barstow full disclosure we're in barstow it's no big secret we're all here everybody's here Get that out of the way. Um, I actually spawned in an empty world. 
that's fine um so let's pretend that we have you know trains over here in the bowl tracks consolidation yard i'm sorry not consolidation classification yard you have trains that come in from the receiving yard down yonder they go over the hump they get classified trains get built you know two cars get coupled together they get married and they decide they want to have little box cars and they go off on their own merry way you have your your yard jobs down here we'll pull them out of the bowl tracks they'll put them over here and assemble them on the ready tracks the departure tracks whatever you want to call them and from there they have to be inspected so this would be what we would consider the initial terminal for any train that originates out of Barstow. This is the initial terminal for it. So when the trains get over here to the departure yard, now I'm not going to say I know how they do it out in Barstow. Somebody in the comments is going to say, well, they take it over to this place and they expect them here. And then they do this and then they got to go here. It's like for my intents and purposes, we're going to say they pull them out of this track and they put them over here and then they inspect them here. Everybody good with that? Looking at you in the back. Okay, so we have the departure tracks over here that we're going to use for inspection purposes. Okay, so we have a train assembled. It's luckily four cars. We're grossly overpowered. I know. It's my railroad. Get off my back. So, train consists. Two locomotives, four cars. We have an EOT on the back. The procedure for a class one initial terminal inspection. The things that have to be done. You have to walk down both sides of the train. You have to visually inspect both sides of the train. You have to verify that the brake cylinders and these are on the other end. No, actually, I was right. You have to verify that the brake cylinder, which I'm thinking should be this guy right here. You have to, to verify that the piston travel is correct. You have to verify that the brake cylinder is working. The brake valves are operating. You have to verify that you have train line continuity from one end of the train to the other. Angle cocks are open. Nothing's hanging. You know, there's not a dead body hanging off of this. Some deer wrapped up in the in the uh, journals you know springs aren't falling out it is an actual inspection the inspections on these are for plane or i'm sorry not for roller bearings is a lot more uh simplistic than in the old days you did an initial terminal on like plane bearing ones um one of the things that they would be looking for you'd have your journal box here you'd have to flip the lid open uh, you'd look inside, you'd make sure the journal's not scored, you'd have to move the, the journal pad around, fill it up with oil, and move on to the next one for a thousand axles all the way down. Usually took three or four people to do it, efficiently. Anyway. So you might, if you can see them, you might look and see if there's flat spots on here, like I said, springs that are out of place. Um, bearings that have noticeably gotten warm if you've seen metal that's been blued because it got too hot you might look for that you look for the same thing on the tread of the wheels you know all the stuff that nobody looks at when they do an initial terminal i didn't say that um <clears throat> i'm i'm just i'm just saying because i lived it that's that's all i'm saying uh, i have actually i wasn't involved with it i have seen what happens when you don't inspect a plane bearing box and it wasn't their fault they weren't necessarily trained correctly to know what to look for we had a uh we had a car that they had swapped the trucks on and it was a plane bearing truck and they didn't check the wedge that sits on top of the crown brass and um when they set the truck down, they didn't make sure that all that reset. And when they did their class one that morning, they didn't know what they were looking for. So they had a hot box going, they got about halfway down the railroad and noticed smoke was coming out of the back of it. Uh, got it back, they fixed it. One of the guys with the railroad, he, 
he called me and he says, hey, can you go over and check and make sure that they got it right? So I go over and I look and I open up one of the journal boxes and uh, it ain't right. And I sent I sent him a text and I say, you know, this ain't right. He said, well, they, they told me they fixed it. And I sent him a picture of it and he said, which one are you looking at? And I said, well, I'm on the northeast corner of it. And he said, that's, that's not the one that was smoking. I said, oh. So then I went to the other ones and there were three more that were like that. And I said, we got to lift this car up and we have to fix this. That was one of the times when I had to get on my smoke, bo- or smoke box. I had to get on my soap box for the guys that were handling train. I wasn't, I wasn't in the operation side, but I worked for the railroad at that point. I had, I had to pull the, had to pull the brakeman aside and I say, you know, this is, it's called a class one inspection for a reason. You have to, you have to actually inspect. You can't just open the lid and say, yeah, it looks good. You have to, you have to look for stuff. You know. I, I said it a little bit more firmer than that, but it was basically, it is an inspection. You are looking for defects. You're going to find them. You don't report them. That's on you. Because if there's a derailment and it's caused by something like that, they're going to go, they're going to follow the paper trail and they're going to say, well, so-and-so at this yard said that this train was ready to go. Now, Mr. So-and-so, did you inspect this journal? You said it was fine. Did you see any defects? That's... I've had those conversations before. They're not fun. They're not fun. Anyway, we're talking about class one brake test. Uh, you're you're inspecting. Prototypical situation. You are actually inspecting defects. You're looking for stuff that ain't right. Easiest way to explain it. You're gonna walk down both sides, as I said. You're checking for piston travel. The reason why piston travel is important. And it's going to be hard to to show. Um, where where you be? There you be. So it's going to be kind of. You might have a hard time hearing me, but I'll try and speak up as much as I can. Inside this brake cylinder, there is a spring. There's a spring that runs from here down to where the piston seats, and it is. It's the return spring for when the piston goes goes out and extends and the air comes off the brake cylinder, the spring pushes it back. So what happens is when you get excessive spring trap or um, excessive piston travel, as the piston goes out, it's compressing that spring. If you know anything about the physics of springs, you know that the spring rate changes as the spring gets compressed. You compress a spring, it has more resistance, more force exerting against it. The longer the piston travel gets, the more the spring compresses, which means there's more pressure pushing back against the piston. When your piston travel gets too long, the spring tension can actually overcome your braking effort. So when you have a piston that has long travel, or a brake cylinder has long piston travel, your braking effort is greatly reduced from what it would be if it was within spec. That's why there is a spec for a certain size brake cylinder. So you've got eights and tens, 14s, 18s in some cases, they don't use them anymore. Um, Eights, nines, tens, somewhere in that neighborhood, that's what you're gonna see now. Used to be think I have seen an 11 in my career. Those are very, very, uh, very rare. Tens are probably the more common ones now. Um, but there is a maximum per size. So you're looking for that. Like I said, you're looking for anything that ain't right. And then you get all the way down here to the end of the train. And then you're going to look around the back of it. You hear Fred back here whining because the little generator thingy's going. And this one's doing the same thing. Um, that's something else that you would check. So you're looking for all that. You might look for a handbrake chain that's not applied, something that's dragging. I have seen handbrake chains that they might stretch. They might have been put together incorrectly. They're rubbing up against the axle. That is a no-no. 
handbrake train anything rubbing against an axle it is a no-no um angle cocks that are leaking you're audibly listening for air leaks anything that's out of the ordinary you might even check on these hopper cars you might check and make sure that the the doors are closed make sure nothing's spilling out of them uh or you know let's be real you're making sure that it's going to get out of the yard because if it gets out of the yard it's somebody else's problem so that's that's that in a nutshell that's the inspection the other i said that you're checking the brakes that is part of it the the other portion of this oops, stop that the other portion is it is an air brake check and i said that you're looking for piston travel and whatnot the engineer will put a 20 pound reduction on the train and we'll do that in a second i'm just kind of walking through it 20 pound reduction brakeman whoever random person you met they're going to walk the train called walking the application walking on the brakes they're checking to make sure all the brakes apply front to rear every car you get to the rear if you have an independent gauge hand gauge you put it on the rear verify all that um you would you would initially check to make sure that you have whatever his feed valve pressure is which we'll say 90. the rule is that you're allowed the rear of your train is allowed to be within 15 pounds of your feed valve setting so long as it is not below 75 psi if you're operating at 90 15 pounds is 75 you cannot go below 75 these digital gauges you can't you can't snuff it anymore you can't fudge the records because the digital gauge don't it tells you a number the analog gauges with the needle you could kind of turn your head one way and say well it looked like 75 when i was looking at it from here you can't do that with these digital ones um because you have an eot that's reporting you can actually use the eot as long as it has been calibrated and it's within date okay you verify all that you had a good you had good air pressure through the train you're good on both ends you make your 20 pound reduction he's walked the train he's checked everything that looks good now he will call for knocking off the brakes you put the train brake into release air starts charging up he's on the rear of the train usually by the time the rear has released that means everything else is, should be released if the rear has started releasing everything else should be releasing and then he will walk off the uh the set and he all he's doing is going back you're checking to make sure that all the piston travel that the the brake cylinders have uh retracted the pistons and the brakes are released you do that you're good there is one more thing that happens and i'll talk about it when we're in the cab you are testing for leakage so think about this every single connection that you've got a potential leak here here and here there's four potential things in this little area right here that can leak if you have a hundred cars four and there's four per car because each car has a glad hand has an angle cock on both ends i'm not gonna talk about the valves just yet you have an angle cock and a glad hand with a gasket on both ends so you have four straight up things that can leak times that by 100 cars there's 400 potential leaks in that train not counting the locomotives not counting the brake valves not counting unions not counting anything else that's why most brake pipes now are welded because it reduces the number of threaded joints that could potentially leak the rule is you're allowed five pounds of leakage per minute so when your brakeman starts up here and he's walking the set 
you've given yourself time for the break to set up and all that and then you start your count you're timing a minute and then you you see if you have five pounds a minute if you go over that you say we're not good you got to go find the lead that's when the brakeman usually hates life because the digital ones if you're six pounds used to be when you had the analog gauges you could kind of look at it and say well that looks like five ish the digital ones if it's six you got to check it in all honesty you get over three pounds you really really probably ought to be looking the reason why is because if you've got a leak you can potentially set it's a little different with 26s because 26s will self-maintain who is this making all that noise we'll get it son um 26 is a self-maintaining valve meaning that it will keep the train line up to pressure as long as the brake stands cut in so enough talking let's kind of walk through what would happen let's go up into the cab i thought i had one let's go up in here into the cab okay dc i don't know why it had a set on it and while i'm thinking about it let me go ahead and I think whenever I relinquish them, they they put a set on them for whatever reason. Stop it! I don't want you. Okay. So let's get back up in here. So we're in release. These are electronic brake valves. Well, I can't remember the model number. Uh. I th uh, Wabtec may it's now called fast break I can't remember this specific model it is a version of the 26 I want to say it is a 26 K I do not remember off the top of my head but 26 K sounds right this is an electric brake valve and I'm calling it electric brake valve because um, you are not actually controlling directly the brake valve used to be if you think of i'll actually show you i will actually show you rather than try to explain it let me just grab a locomotive you'll work place it somewhere Let's get in here for a second so typical 26l this is a mechanical brake valve meaning when you turn that handle oops wrong one the wrong one when you move this brake handle you are physically moving a spindle that goes down through this housing that's opening these ports and there's springs and everything and you can actually feel it through the handle you are physically opening that valve you are modulating the valve you like that word you're you're moving you are control directly controlling the brake just like this guy right here this is the cutout valve for this one it's got a little spring in it and a ball you turn it one way it's actually it's actually set to out right now um you got cut out freight down here on the bottom you can see the p there that's for passenger that's for graduated release freight direct release cut out doesn't do anything but you are you are directly controlling this now on the the other one over here when you move that valve you are there is like a uh like a rheostat or a potentiometer or a pos some kind of position sensor that as you move it forward i don't want to move it forward because i don't want to mess up the set um, but as you move it forward 
it's sending an electrical signal to a solenoid that is regulating what your brake valve is supposed to be doing. It's electrically, it's electronically controlled. The reason why these do that, if you have distributed power and it's radio controlled and you have a mid unit, the radio signal carries the position of this valve and it sends it to the DPUs and the DPUs can initiate a reduction from where they are. So talk about pressure waves here. Um, I did a test on run eight just to verify it. The pressure wave of your application is about a thousand feet per second. If you've got a 5,000 foot train, it's going to take about five seconds, can take a little bit longer, anywhere from five to 10 seconds is what I was finding for the pressure wave to reach all the way to the end. When you have multiple DPUs, you can, it's like if you have mid units and you want to make an application on the head end, the signal, especially if you have a unit like this one that has another electric brake, the DPU in the middle will see that you made an application. It makes an application as well. Same thing if you bail off, you, if you bail off on your independent brake, it bails off on its independent brake. So you can relay what you want it to do. That can initiate a, an application for the other half of the train. So if you have a thousand foot train that takes, you know, one second for the pressure wave to get there and you have a mid unit DPU that's halfway, when you make your application, instead of it taking a full second, it only takes a half a second because you're only doing half as much. If that makes any sense. The reason why I'm telling you that is because the way that these units do their cutout and everything is different from how that SD40 does it. That is, that is, that right there, looking at you, that is old busted. This is new hot. Make sense? As I said, this is all digital. That's analog. You can't, you can't really fudge these because this is, it's smarter than you are. So you, you, you kind of have to do what it says. And like I said, you saw the cutout valve was on, this one was on the stand. If I remember right, these guys, you have to go through the menu buttons and you actually select cutout. That's one of the things that I thought was cool about Train Sim World. It's probably one of the only things that I thought was cool about Train Sim World. But, um, yeah, it was that you could actually cut out the valves because you went to the screen and you could, you could hit cut out. So all that being aside, initial terminal inspection. And I'm, I'm going through all this just so you kind of have an understanding of it. I know that I tend to ramble. I try and give as much information as I can. I know it's annoying. So for your initial terminal inspection, we have, we have 90 pounds on the equalizing reservoir. And I'll go through that here in just a second. 90 pounds on the equalizing reservoir, 90 pounds on the brake pipe, 90 pounds on the rear, flow is at zero, which means there's no air moving through the brake pipe. Main reservoir is sitting at 136 pounds per square inch, and the brake cylinder on the locomotive is sitting 72. I don't like how this system is laid out because I'm gonna go, I'm gonna run back over here to my my SD40 for just a second. Run faster. Okay. Oh, God. I said relinquish, man. Can be a little bit annoying. Okay. Get up here. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to do shift F7 so that you pressurize. Think of your brake system as two different um two different 
two separate systems. So I'm going to call this, this is supply. This is service. Okay. This guy right here, this just, this is kind of like the light on your computer screen that telling you the hard drive is in service. This tells you something. This says, this is sent a signal. This is receiving a signal to say, and something's going on. Okay. This is your processor light. The red needle is your main reservoir. White needle, equalizing reservoir. Equalizing reservoir is a misnomer. There is technically no equalizing reservoir. It is a series of reservoirs that are a certain extent. It's, it's a balancing thing. Red needle on this one, brake cylinder. White brake, uh, the white is your brake pipe. Supply, service. The way this works, your total supply is your your break your uh, main reservoir. So we should be sitting about 136 pounds. Pretty typical. Equalizing reservoir, quote unquote reservoir, is 90 pounds. What that is is that is telling the brake valves on the car. We're, I'm using this in broad terms. I know this isn't how it works, but I'm using it. I'm trying to, to explain it as best I can. The equalizing reservoir is telling the brake pipe what it needs to do. So it's telling all the brake valves on the train. We're going to be sitting at 90 pounds. 90 pounds happens to be what our feed valve is set at. We can change it. We, If we were doing passenger service, we'd be running at 110. You could do 110 on freight and be just fine. Um, the reason, I think most of the reason why they don't go up that high is because it is a little strenuous on your air compressors when you have a long train and you're just trying to keep that pressure up, especially if you have a lot of little leaks. 90 seems to be a little more forgiving. You make a brake pipe reduction. And it's, it's going to be hard with a, uh, with a locomotive because it's going to be instant because there's no brake pipe. But what happens is your equalizing reservoir reduces and then it's telling the train line that you have to reduce with me. So typically what would happen is if you have a longer train, equalizing reservoir would come down and then you would slowly watch the, uh, uh, your brake pipe would just slowly come down until it meets and then it would stop. And then you have equalization, you know, equalizing reservoir, equalization. Your red needle is your brake cylinder. That is getting directly from your main reservoir. That's the reason why these are, I'm not gonna say it's, it's exactly why, but I'm pretty sure that's why they color coded them the way they did. This one is actually supplying, there is no valve in between except for maybe a J valve or something like that, that uh, is regulating it. So when you apply your independent, See how the main reservoir needle is going down? So they are, they're together. They are one, if you will. Same thing if you release. If the compressor was running, you would notice um, bail off here. You would notice that your um, main reservoir is it's taking directly out of it. Now the main reservoir is, is actually feeding everything. The independent, because the brakes on a locomotive are different from train brakes. Um, locomotive brakes work off of positive displacement. Train brakes work off of negative displacement. What that means is on a locomotive cylinder, you're actually putting the air. You are taking air out of the main reservoir. You are putting it into the brake cylinder. This right here, you're, if it says 70 PSI, you are putting, you are taking 70 PSI from the main reservoir and you are putting it into the brake cylinder. The train line, negative displacement, you are making a reduction on the train valve that opens a valve, that opens the control valves on the cars and they use the reservoir that is on each car to depending on how much you move and depending on how the valve is set up and if they have a J valve, it's different. 
If you make a five pound reduction, the valve opens up so much, it lets air from the reservoir on the car go into the, into the brake cylinder. And then that's what applies your, your, um, your brake. I know it's a lot. I didn't want to get this in depth into it, but it was just, you know how I am. I'm train of thought. It's better to do it now while we're talking about it. So that's how that works. Positive displacement on the locomotive, negative displacement on the, on the, um, train line. Now, the reason why I'm going into all that is when you do your leakage test, you would, you're going to make a 20 pound set. So let's see, you're going to go until this needle is down here at 70 pounds right there. That's 20 pounds. Okay. We would wait until we're sure we would actually be looking at this. We would wait until we're not getting any airflow. Then we would come over here. We would cut out this guy and then we would pay attention to this needle, this white needle here and this white needle only. You don't look at this one. If this one moves, you got a problem. This is the needle that you'd look at your brake line, train line that this is what the train is doing. Okay. Other thing you want to consider train locomotive, but like I said, supply service. So you would, you would time out one minute. Once you're sure that you're not getting the airflow, you could look at this guy if you have it. Or if you have an EOT and you can verify if you've got somebody on the rear that's saying, yeah, I see your reduction, you're sitting at 70 pounds, whatever. Then you can, um, you can start your timer. You cut out your brake stand either by this guy or by your, M um, your MFD. You look at this needle, time it for a minute, and then... You know, if it's under five pounds, you're good. If it's over five pounds, you walk the train, you find where the hole is. Now, do it a little differently. Sometimes you can get a false reading. Um, these have been known to lie. Um, even with the hand gauge, sometimes you can still have some air that's exhausting. Depending on how the valves are set up on the cars, you might still have one that's still venting a little bit and that can show up as a leak. Man, they're multiplying. They're like rabbits. Um, what we would do and what I've, what I've done in the past is instead of one minute, we might do two. So you time the first minute, you don't throw it away. You look at your number and if you get three pounds the first minute, well, let's just say if you get two pounds first minute, you get one pound the next minute. Okay. That's three pounds total over two minutes. You divide it by two. It's a pound and a half. You got two pounds. You can do it like that too. You're just, you're verifying that you don't have, um, a lot of leakage. I know we're going through this in run eight. It's a simulator. You really can't do all this stuff, but you know, it's just food for thought. So let's get off of this and we'll actually walk through what we do on the, what we would do for a class one. I don't even know how long I've been talking. 38 minutes. Good grief. We'll try and keep this one under an hour. No gear, no promises. Okay. So we're here, we're doing our initial terminal. We're going to do our initial terminal. 90 pounds, 90 pounds, 90, 0, 131, 72. All hunky dory peachy king. Guy on the ground says, okay, 4150, set him up. So what we do, we just make a 20 pound reduction. So we're looking at the equalizing reservoir. We go till we get to 70. And there's 70. This brake pipe is still kind of low and da coming down. It's not showing any flow. The rear is showing 70, 71 ish. So, what would happen? We'll go down here and be Joe. 
Joe would be down here. He's going to be looking right there. Now he would, if you didn't have an EOT, you would either have a guy that's on the rear with a gauge and he would say, I see your reduction. And then you might have somebody else that would walk it. So what Joe would say is, all right, 41, whatever. See an application walking off or walking train, something like that. And then he would just go car by car and say, yep, good good mm, good and then you might go ahead depending on the length of the train depending on how many people you got it helps if you have two people because then you can have one to walk down one side the other one walk down the other or in the case of some railroads they have ATVs that they can do it with they just kind of drive down the side of the train so you'd say okay we'll pretend we got somebody on the other side Say okay, 4150, good set, knock them off. Good set, reduction on the rear, blah blah blah. Knock them off. So you're up here, you're looking at your at your brake cylinder. You wait until you see your release, and then you you walk up the side train. And then when you you would verify your pressure on the rear before you started walking, but then you know you got a release all the way through say okay good release as long as his leakage was good as long as he was under five pounds a minute he's uh you're square that class one terminal is done that only has to be done once every 24 hours uh or until you you know you break up a a train gets broke apart and then reassemble then you do it again but if you if you if a train's been off air for more than 24 hours you have to do it again okay so to well we'll 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 leave that be i'm gonna get back up here and i'll just show you how long it can take so we'll say that we went through we did our cutout everything leakage was good we do the release went straight to 90 it's coming up to 90 flows at 24 this is a short train we've got two locomotives that are putting out a lot of cfm um so it doesn't take very long so anything below 60 cfm cubic feet per minute is considered a release just remember that so if you're if you're trying to do it prototypical um if you do we'll see it whenever i do uh when we do the class three I promise these next two won't take nowhere near as long. Um, when you do your class three, you're looking for um, your CFM to get below 60 because that indicates that you, that is considered a relief. I, I used to know the instructor at the ready center for CSX and he explained to me why 60 F CFM is the number and I cannot remember. Uh, I, he explained it to me, and when, I, when he did, I was like, okay, that makes sense. It has to do with the way the valves are set up. They have to see a wave. They have to see so much movement in the, in the pressure differential in the pipe in order for it to actually activate the valves. So, and it seems like 60 was the threshold. Once you got below 60, you're not doing anything. So we'll let this charge up. Flows back down to zero. This train's done. Good for its class one. Now, class two. We're not going to worry about the thousand mile test because, in all honesty, I don't even think there's a thousand miles worth of railroad in run eight. So we're not going to worry about that one. So, class two brake test. I called it a transfer test. So, we're going to pretend that UP 1988 here has had its class one test. It's done, ready to go. Behind it, there is a set of cars. These cars were set out by a local. So we're going to pretend that this is a work train that we're running. This train, this train with these blue box cars 
has been class one at its at its initial terminal it's been sent out it's a local job it's going to pick up cars now let's say that this is an industry they have their own crew they have to come out on the general system trackage as per the cfr they go out on the general system trackage they've got to have a class one initial terminal before they can go out and before they can go out into the system so these cars down here have had an initial terminal inspection before they uh before they left it's been less than 24 hours since they were since they were class one this train here as i said has been class one we're gonna tie on to it so i'm gonna go ahead and do that now let me get the let me get the dumaflachis off here and all that sort of thing Let's just go let me pull my thing up here Okay, it is working. So let's go, if we can. So let's quickly go over here. We're gonna hop on the back. Uh, there we go. And listen to the wonderful sound of Fred, the mating call of the illustrious EOT. And yes, we are going to stop before we get there and slam the EOT into a knuckle because they're expensive. But the premise of a class two is if you have a set of cars, that has been now this is the way that I understand it reading through it because we never had to really mess with it too much. If you have a stand of cars that's been class one within a 24 hour window, what you do is or even if it hasn't been class one in the window, the way that I understand that rule is that you would, you would put these cars in and you would do your inspection on only those cars. So the rest of the train, let's say we split the train in half. We're going to put this cut in the middle. What we would do is we would only inspect the cars that we're putting in. Let's go ahead and Go ahead and slow down there, Jim. We'll give ourselves some feet. That looks about a hundred feet or so. Good enough for me. And we would close and blissful silence. We remove our EOT. We get well, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna we're gonna walk. We're going to walk and clear for a mile back up. Promise I'm not going to break anything. Maybe. Is that another one? Good Lord, man. It's a busy day for, for intermodal. Almost had it. I'm losing my touch, man. I was going to be slick about that one. I hit it just a little bit too hard. Okay. So we do our normal thing here. We, let's see. There we go. Can, we're going to connect the air hoses. Partial open on this side. Full open on that side. I'm going to watch my CFM. We're going to pretend there's an engineer up there. He's going to say, okay, coming down. Now we can go ahead and open that guy up. See all that. I already charged this train up. We're, we're pretending like this just got set out not long ago and it's not still on air. So what would happen is you do that. You would go back here. You would put your EOT on hand or uh, your hand gauge or whatever. You come back here, you listen to the wonderful mating sound of the EOT. Is it going to work? Fred? Fred? Are you okay? Oh, well, hang up. Ain't got to listen to him. So what you would do, we'll just go back up to the head. 
same thing. You wait for your air. Let's see. Whoa, where did I go? Come back here to the end. And he would say, okay. And then you would just, you would, you do your normal thing. So we would make a 20 pound reduction. I'm just going to watch my ER here. You go down to 70 pounds. Close enough. You'd see your reduction if you had a brake gauge. He sees it up there on the HOT. Um, and then you just do your you do your inspection back here on this kind of cars. You go down one side, you check them. You go down the other side, you check them. You verify the application. You verify all that, and then you um, and then you do the same thing in the release. So we'd say that's good. There's the release. You verify it on the rear. He verifies it on the rear if he's got something that's telling him telemetry and then you walk the release and then you're done if he doesn't have any if he doesn't have any excessive leakage you're good class two out of the way i told you this one would be a little bit quicker the last one is a very quick one it's actually one of my favorite brake tests because it takes all of about 30 seconds to do but we're we're done with this guy, even though I could do it on this one. I'm not going to. I'm going to do it on this one up here because it is because it's already charged. We get in here. Class three brake test. A couple of things that you would do your class three brake test. Reasons why you would do a class three brake test. You're changing locomotives. You are setting out a car and you're not putting it back in. So like if you're working a local or something like that, you you take a car, you set it off the train, or a cut of cars, you set it off the train, you put the train back together. As long as that train has been terminal, has had its class one within 34, 24 hours and it hasn't been off air, you can do a class three set and release, continuity brake check, however you want to call it. What that is, is you just, it's as simple as this, okay? Let's just say we cut out five cars. We set five cars out of the train. We, we, cut, the, we cut the consist in two, set out five cars. We put the train back together. What we're doing is we're gonna make a 20 pound reduction We are looking for your reduction on the rear. You verify that, and then you release. Pressure go down, pressure go up, you're good. Simple as that. Class three, like I said, replacing a locomotive, um, cutting out cars, you cut car if you're putting cars in class two supply um it's a very simple test train line continuity the whole purpose of this test is to make sure you've got all your angle cocks open that you have 100 percent control of your train because if you think about it if you go out and you're on a work train you cut your consist in half you set out a set of cars the consist the cut that you set out should be an emergency because you would have left the angle cock open um just as a safety because you'd have handbrakes on it but you'd leave it open you go over you set cars in you set cars out you come back the cars that you're attached to are going to have the angle cock closed it could be raining you could get distracted you know whatever um You couple on, you lace the air hoses, something happens, you forget to open up the angle cocks. You go to do your class three, and I'll actually, by God, I can show you. So let's just say we cut out, there was a cut of cars here, a block of cars here in the middle. This is the track, this is the, the cut that we left out. We're going to go ahead and just close this guy here. 
we just coupled back on somebody calls us on the radio whatever we get distracted somebody's walking down the street whatever so what we do we get ready to make our application we do 20 pounds and it no move on the rear there's no movement to the rear so, so you have you do not have train line continuity what that is telling you is something is either inoperable an angle cot got left closed you know stuff's not hooked up you don't have control of your entire train that means that joe's got to go back there and figure out what the problem is you know you and then you know you just you release it you let it you let it uh hook up he go he runs back blames it on turtles that are beside the main line closing it and whatever do a partial open just so it doesn't bust it we fix it go back we do an application and it's still not moving oh that's interesting i think it's might be because might be ah that's closed that's why okay now it should work i don't know why it closed it only closed one of them so now we do the reduction you see it on the rear and that's a successful test there is one additional test and i will just briefly go over this one you do your standing locomotive test it's that's something the mechanical department would do um by and large and all it is is you're just you're verifying that your your locomotive leakage is zero so what you do is i can't do it on this one because it's attached what i would do if i was going to do a standing locomotive test you get on this guy we're going to pretend it's running you kind of do your walk around. You check your headlights. You make sure your headlights are working. If it's got ditch lights, you make sure those are working. The uh, horn works. Bell works. Uh, God, which one is the Anders? I can't remember which one's sand. Is it C? Zero. Anyway, you check your sanders. You make sure they're working. You put your, your locomotive brake on. The brake cylinders don't move on this. You verify that your pistons are moving. You verify um, you would take a hammer. You'd go around. You'd tap on all these bolts. You'd make sure nothing's loose. That is something that the FRA looks for, by the way. Just telling you guys. You know, you want to impress the FRA inspectors, go around, hammer on the bolts. They see the paint's chipped. They know you're doing it. Same. Now, if they're rusty, they're going to say, well, why ain't there shiny metal on there? But that is something that the FRA looks for, is they look for paint chips on these bolts. Because that means that you're actually going around and hammer testing them. Um, something they do on 92-day inspections is they they would test the fuel shutoffs. Um, but you're checking headlights, front, rear. You'd also check your, your sanders, your brake pipes. You'd look at your knuckles, make sure that these guys your MU hoses aren't cracked make sure that's not leaking you know just a general overview when windows aren't cracked not leaking oil everywhere you verify your oils and stuff like that and then the standing locomotive test you get up in the cab locomotives by itself you do a class one initial terminal but it's locomotive by itself and what you're doing is you're you're verifying the locomotive has zero leakage and the reason why you want your locomotive to have zero leakage is because you don't want it to be applying the rest of your train and that's basically that's basically it there is some more stuff that goes along with it there's handbrake tests and all this sort of stuff you know has to hold for so many seconds and i think it's not two or three now um to make sure that it's good you know that's just the kind of stuff but i have rambled on long enough this is almost an hour long video so that is the brake test that you will see a general overview of how 
brake systems on locomotives and trains work and um if you like these tutorials i will try and do more of them i can't really think of any if there's some other ones that you want to see just you know put a comment in the uh in the comment section you know where the comments go um I can't really think of anything else to add to it. One of the other things I will add this Jerry very briefly and then I'll, I'll go from there. You would check the, and I never had to deal with hot, so I don't know when they check them, but that is one of the procedures is that you have to, you have to verify that that works. Now, I don't know if they have to do it whenever they get put on there, but I do know at some point you have to verify that your EOT dump works. So, on that dumpage, uh, that is all I have for this video. And again, if you have some stuff that you want to see, put it down in the comment section and I will try and do a video on it. The next one, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I may just run a train without any commentary or I may do something completely different altogether. Um, we'll see. So that's it for this one. I will see you next time.